two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I entitled today's message, The True Measuring Stick. In our society, we have been taught to measure ourselves by those around us. For example, you have the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class that we all measure ourselves against in our social standing and our income. To put it another way, we measure ourselves to others by the jobs we have and the money we make. We even measure ourselves when we're in sports against those that we play against. For me, naturally of course, since I'm a bowler, that's where my measuring began. When I first began, I wasn't that good, so I measured myself against the other bowlers in Bantam League. As I got better, I started to measure myself against those that bowled Junior League. And once I made it to Junior League, I started measuring myself against the men that bowled on Men's League. And once I got to Men's League, I started continue to measure myself, but this time I was looking down on the men that I once thought were great. They were still great, but my pride took over and my arrogance, so I thought that I was better than they were. My point is this, we tend more times than not to measure ourselves by those around us, whether we measure ourselves to someone who we consider the lowest or someone that we consider is above us. And that's what this parable is about, is measuring ourselves. In other words, the measuring stick gets used more than we'd like to admit. Let's look at the Pharisee. Prayer was observed two or three times a day, morning and evening, and sometimes during noon. Prayer was held in the temple, and it was considered especially fruitful during these hours of prayer. That is why so many people went up to the temple to offer prayer in the morning and in the evening. The Jewish law prescribed one fast, which was to be observed on the Day of Atonement. But there were those like the Pharisee who fasted twice a week because they wanted special praise. Therefore, they usually fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. And I know what you're thinking. Why Mondays and Thursdays? Why couldn't it be Tuesdays or Fridays or something? 
Mondays and Thursdays just happen to be market days, which brought people in to the temple, in to Jerusalem from the countryside. In other words, Jerusalem would be hustling and bustling full of people doing their shopping on those two particular days. Therefore, the Pharisees would have the biggest possible audience during those days to show their piety while they walked around with whitened faces and disheveled clothes. My point is this. Here we have this Pharisee who devoted his life not only to studying, studying the Mosaic Law, which is also known as Torah, but they also practice that law diligently. As they worked so hard to uphold those laws because they felt that bring them to be righteous. In other words, we have a class of Jews known as the Pharisees who considered themselves the godliest people within the nation and the scrupulously accurate followers of the law. They believed they were at the top. They were above everyone. James Edwards puts it like this. Pharisees were known as a class of people as whose behavior and their estimation is deemed sufficient evidence of their righteousness and who despise those who fail to meet their standard. Their standard. You could say, using the measuring stick of society, the Pharisees was viewed as having a better moral character than those around them. Because they, after all, fasted more than what the law required. Therefore, the Pharisees was using the measuring stick to show how he measured up to those around him as he stood in the temple so called pray. I say so called praying because he really wasn't praying to God instead he was so confident in himself that he was boasting about his own righteousness Therefore, he was arrogantly bragging about his accomplishments while he expressed contempt towards those whom he viewed as unworthy. The Cornerstone Bible commentary on Luke put it like this. He waxed eloquent in a mood of self-congratulation that praised his ability to keep the basic ethical commandments of the law of Moses. He knew that every pious Jew was required to fast only one day of the year, the Day of Atonement. But he prided himself on his punctiliously ways, fasting twice a week and dutifully giving a tenth of his tithings, his income, as required by the Jewish law. He thought himself to be righteous and pointed that out when he pulled out the measuring stick and compared himself to the humble tax collector standing far off. In other words, he really did not pray. Instead, he just told God how good he was. 
Let me put it this way. There are many hypocrites that go to the temple, which is the church, thus maintaining an external religion for everyone to see. And every day, like the Pharisees, for all to see. Mark 11, 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And Matthew 6, 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. Now let us look at the tax collector. Tax collectors were considered traitors by many Jews because they sold themselves out to work for the Roman government, the same government that was ruling over the Israelite nation. Plus, tax collectors often used their authority to take advantage of their fellow Jews to increase their money, their own profit, to line their own pockets. In other words, tax collectors were viewed in the same both as robbers, greedy individuals, unrighteous people, and adulterers. To put it another way, just hearing the name tax collector probably sparked people instantly to think of this man as a cheat and a thief. Plus, they would think that being, hearing the word tax collector, that they would be required to pay higher taxes than what the Roman government authorized them to pay. What I'm getting at, the tax collector is viewed as being the worst of the worst, thus being equal to prostitutes which were considered the lowest of low. <clears throat> Therefore, the Pharisee was viewed, viewed the tax collector, as I said, the lowest of low, along with the prostitutes. Therefore, he felt that this tax collector could not earn or deserve any righteousness of his own. Have you ever experienced a time when you got in trouble with your parents, maybe a friend, for doing something wrong? Or maybe you just felt a little distance from them because of that wrong. Or maybe you did something that caused a rift between a friend Therefore, to get back into right standing with them, it took you to apologize and them to forgive you. Or possibly you had a friendship that you went above and beyond and you felt like everything was great, not realizing the relationship was not going the way you thought. When you look at the difference between the Pharisee and this tax collector and the things that I pointed out thus far, we can see they are opposite ends of the spectrum. The Pharisee being at the top and the tax collector being at the lowest. Or to go along the lines of today's title of today's sermon, they were at the opposite.
across the ends of the measuring stick. In other words, the Pharisee stood by himself, which may have been closer to the sanctuary, while the tax collector stood off at a distance, not feeling worthy of being in or that close to the sanctuary. The Pharisee spoke confidently about his piety because he had gone above and beyond the requirements of Torah. Therefore, the Pharisee felt he was in the right standing with God because of all the good works that he done. Because that's how they viewed their righteousness was by works. While the tax collector felt he was unworthy to not only stand in the sanctuary, but as he prayed, he was felt unworthy to look toward heaven while he prayed. He even beat his chest, not because he was acting like a gorilla, but because that was a sign of contrition or grief. Jeremiah 31, 19. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. In Luke 23, 48. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. My point is this, the Pharisee confidently lifted his head proudly toward God as he boasted about himself. But he failed to do one thing. He did not confess any sin because he believed himself to be righteous through his works. His pride was getting in his way. While the tax collector, knowing that he is a sinner, knew he could not raise his head or anything else to God, all he could do was bow and beg for mercy. Therefore, the Pharisee failed to recognize that he was not in the right standing with God. While the tax collector knew he was a sinner and was not in right standing, but he begged for God's mercy and in return found himself in right standing with God. In Greek, the tax collector refers to himself as the sinner which indicates both the degree and awareness of his sin. He knew that he needed God's mercy, so he begged. 1 Timothy 1.15 Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. And Paul, being a disciple, knew he was a sinner in need. God's mercy. Luke 5.32 I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. My point is this, the tax collector pleads for God's mercy because he is the only one who can offer such mercy for sin. Where the Pharisee just strutted around in front of God and 
and the world showing off his virtues. Therefore, when Jesus makes the statement that the tax collector went home justified, he was saying that this man not only was forgiven of his sin, but he was now in the right standing before God. In other words, the tax collector, after completing his prayer, stood before God, possessing a renewed relationship with him. To put it another way, because the tax collector had faith in God for the forgiveness of his sin, he was forgiven and was justified thus being in the right standing with the Father. Whereas the Pharisee, who rejected God's gift of justification that comes through faith because he relied on his own righteousness for salvation. And as we know, salvation does not come through works. It comes through faith in Jesus Christ what he accomplished on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. In other words, salvation is by grace through faith. Therefore, our justification is due to God's mercy alone, not by our works. And we need to come before the Lord daily and seek forgiveness for our sins with a contrite, heartfelt prayer. Because there is no room for boasting as Paul said, unless we're going to boast in the Lord. Who has the power to exalt the humble and humble those who exalt themselves. And just like I mentioned last week, a great reversal is still continuing to happen. As those like the Pharisee who exalt themselves will be humbled while the humble will be exalted. Because justification comes when the humble bow down and repent of their sins and have faith in Jesus Christ. Again, who went to the cross and was resurrected because he was our sacrifice for our sins. I entitled today's sermon, The True Measuring Stick. We talked about how we tend to measure ourselves against others. The Pharisee measured himself against this tax collector. This tax collector measured himself in a way against the Pharisee, not seeing himself not good enough compared to this tax compared to the Pharisee but he knew that he was a sinner and needed grace from God to be saved in the same way we do the same thing and there are Pharisees within the church itself today there's Pharisees in the secular world. But the question is not 
Am I as good as my neighbor? The question is, am I as good as God? And when we ask that question, we know we do not measure up. We need Jesus Christ to save us. We need to repent. And we need to have faith in him to be saved to have that right standing. And it's only through Him that we do measure up. It's only His righteousness that we gain so we can be righteous in the eyes of God. So I end with this. If you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, would you do so today? Allow Him in to your heart him to be your measuring stick to God the Father. And allow him to pour his righteousness upon you so you can be good enough. Shall we pray? Dear Father, once again, we praise you and thank you for waking us up, allowing us to partake in another glorious day that you have given. Another opportunity, Father, to turn away from our sinful ways, to step into your glorious light. Another day, Father, to come before you and repent of our sins. For we are the sinner in need of saving. And it is only through your love and grace that you pour out and your righteousness that you give through faith that makes us measure up to your high standard that you have for entering the kingdom of heaven. We ask you, Father, to continue to give us the wisdom and a discerning heart that we need not only to seek and serve your will, but to be able to go out and live the life that you call us to live, proclaiming the gospel message to the world that we are all sinners in need of repentance and none of us measure up. That is why we need to accept your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior to save us. Again, Father, we are truly grateful for the many blessings you bestow on us. We ask you now, Father, may our lives and the ministry that we serve glorify you in all things. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Amen.
Father. Praise you, thank you, Father, for just being a truly great care and loving you, Father. Thank you so much for your love. Your son's love. Showing that by the way to the cross. And suffering a horrific death, Father. We thank you so much, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life so that we have the opportunity to receive your life with this tremendous act of love. And Father God, we thank you for your love in Christ our Thank you for all those here. Thank you for all those who couldn't be here. Thank you for all those on prayer list, Father. And continually each other up and lift in prayer. This upcoming week, and in your house, Lord, we ask us in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is on page 544, something beautiful. 